in the know, well-funded and well-informed, and they are amassing nine and a half times what the Hunt brothers tried to buy for a reason. And it's important to note that they didn't need to accumulate the physical either when we talk about where silver could possibly be going, because as Ted Butler will tell you, it's all public information. They have done tens of thousands of trades since 2008. And, and since 2008, when they did those 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 trades, whatever it is, not one of them, not one has ever been a loser. Not one. It's a mathematic impossibility. Pick your favorite baseball player who gets 500 at-bats during a regular season. It's like him batting 1,000 for the year, never striking out, never grounding out, never flying out. It's impossible, yet they have found a way to do it. And so when you have a track record of being able to make unlimited money without ever losing a penny on paper, why go to the trouble of accumulating so much silver, if not for a reason. And so when people talk about manipulation, I think it's important to say, why? Why are they manipulating it? And I think the real reason is to corner the physical market in silver. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have a first-time visitor today. Andy Sheckman is the president of Miles Franklin. You've heard that name on our channel before because we used to interview Andy Hoffman, who is the director of communications there, and he's moved on to other pursuits. But we've got Andy, the president of the company, on with us to talk to us not only about what's going on in the gold and silver markets and also what makes Miles Franklin unique. Andy, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I mean, it's great to be here and I appreciate it very much. Letting people know that today is Wednesday, February 26, 2020. And we'd like to kick off with a couple of viewers' questions. Uh, this one is kind of... Uh, Thought it's a head scratcher for anybody who's just starting to show interest in uh, precious metals. It's something that I noticed as well uh, from Frank Carl, who says, "Why does a Canadian maple at 99.99 percent pure and a five dollar face value trade for less than a U.S. silver eagle with only three nines of purity and a one dollar face value?" Well, that's a good question. Uh, really, I guess the the easiest answer is that. And this is going to sound strange, but purity really doesn't matter too much. Let me elaborate, uh, and I'll use the gold of maple leaf as an example. First of all, the Royal Canadian Mint makes the purest gold and silver coins in the world. The Australian Mint is able to make 4.9 fine silver, but other than the Australian Mint, the Canadian Mint, to my knowledge, is the only 4.9 fine silver around. They also coincidentally make the only 5.9 pure gold in their Call of the Wild series. And... Um, but if we look at the gold maple leaf versus the gold eagle, the gold maple leaf is 24 karat, one ounce of pure gold with a $50 face value. The American eagle gold is a $50 face value, one ounce of pure gold, 24 karat, but it has a tenth of an ounce of copper and silver alloy added to it, which decreases the purity and increases the net weight to 1.1 ounce and the purity is 22 karat. So as it pertains to gold, it's really never mattered. As it pertains to silver, same thing. You're talking about one one thousandth of a percent, basically, the difference. Uh, the purity is somewhat irrelevant. And I guess it's a geographic thing. You know, the people in the United States, uh, uh, maybe it's the, the U.S. Mint just charges more. I often recommend Canadian Mint products because I think it's a better value. It, When you're dealing with the purest coins in the world from one of, if not the most respected, there's really no reason to pay an extra premium for the American coins unless you fancy them, truthfully. When uh, we got started here, I wanted to talk to you, let you have a chance to let people know more about what makes Miles Franklin unique and what makes it distinct because there are many, many uh, bullion dealers that people have to choose between. And when people are coming in trying to decide from where they would uh, like to purchase their precious metals, uh, they may be a first time buyer and they may be thinking, you know, this is unfamiliar to me. It's not like I can just go down to the store that I do in my neighborhood to purchase things at, you know, at Home Depot or whatever. So they want to know 
who they can trust and they want to know what makes them different. So could you tell us a little bit about where Miles Franklin came from and really what sets it apart from other dealers? I appreciate that. Well, I hope this isn't too long-winded of an answer for you, but uh, I'll start from the beginning. Um, My company's name, Miles Franklin, is derived from my father's middle name, Miles, and his best friend who loaned us $60,000 in 1989, along with my parents selling their life insurance policies to start Miles Franklin. We're somewhat the embodiment of the American dream. We come from absolutely nothing. Um, In 30 years of business, We've never had a customer complaint, ever. You can spend all day on Google, you won't find one. We have never had a customer complaint on the Better Business Bureau's website. We maintain an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Uh, We are one of only 27 companies ever approved by the United States Mint as an authorized reseller. We were nominated by Prudential Beige when they were one of the six primary U.S. Mint distributors. The primary distributors have to nominate authorized resellers, and it's not something they do very often. Um, We're very proud of our reputation. Uh, We do things analog in a digital world. We've decided that because of identity theft, because of online fraud, we felt it is more appropriate to do things the old-fashioned way in, in something that is centered on privacy We want to make sure that our clients' integrity and safety is is and privacy is is safeguarded. Same thing with our storage programs. Everything's offline so that we don't ever have to worry about a ever growing cyber threat. Um, But the the reputation that we maintain according to the state of Minnesota is irrelevant. Uh, I say that somewhat somewhat tongue-in-cheek. The state of Minnesota is the only state in the United States that regulates this federally non-regulated precious metals industry. Um, in the last five years, three of the biggest online companies in America have gone bankrupt and stolen money from their clients and are either in prison or in the process of going there. Tulving, a few years back, $50 million gone. Bullion Direct, $35 million gone a year after that. And now still in court, going on two plus years now, is uh, Northwest Territorial Mint. And so the state of Minnesota got tired of um, fraud in this industry and regulated it. And in order to sell bullion in the state of Minnesota, whether you live here as I do or live somewhere else and own a precious metals company and sell into the state, you must be licensed, bonded, and background checked. That's enough to have made over 99% of the the competition in the industry boycott our our state because they would have to be subservient to the same set of regulations that we are. The bottom line is we have a great reputation, and I'm really proud of it. We earned it, and we started from scratch, but we're also accredited, and the state of Minnesota will make sure that any transaction done with a bullion company in Minnesota will be the safest in the industry, bar none. So it's kind of like a little bit of insurance on top of a good reputation sandwich. So in addition to these accreditation and bonding and insuring and that sort of thing and the uh, family um, record of integrity and customer satisfaction you built, I also understand that Miles Franklin offers some unique uh, services or some unique products and some unique unique relationships with some trusted names. Uh, Can you help us uh, understand that better? Sure. So we have some exclusive, North American exclusives with Brinks in Canada. Uh, We have the only safe deposit box program, fully insured and 100% non-reportable to the U.S. government uh, via FACTA FBAR 1040. In fact, if you uh, Google basic questions and answers form 8938, that brings you right to the IRS website where they declare what is and what is not reportable. Uh, So... Um, The safe deposit box is the only example that the IRS has ever given as to what is not reportable. Let me back up and explain it a little bit more clearly. So we started our relationship with Brinks in Montreal eight years ago. Uh, In that program, we have fully insured, completely segregated, audited twice per year by third-party auditing, and the only fixed-rate program in the industry where the rate is based upon um, the number of ounces stored rather than the, the value. Um, almost every other uh, storage facility, well, 
all of them. There's one score that has something similar to this. But every single one in North America um, and, and around the world, basically, uses a percentage of asset model. And, and that's because typically the highest cost component in storage is insurance. If what you're insuring goes up in value, so do your insurance premiums. We negotiated a fixed rate with Brinks. So in all of our programs, you're betting on the come, so to speak, um, where the rate will never go higher no matter what gold and silver do. We're really, really very proud of that program. But when we started that program, we asked the IRS, who was somewhat clear yet very not clear as to what was reportable. What I mean by that is that they said, in order for gold and silver to not be reportable outside the United States, it must be directly held in a non-financial institution. Well, we knew Brinks was a non-financial institution, but we asked the IRS, two different attorneys, anonymously, what does directly held mean? For two years, and probably $10,000 in attorney's fees, they never answered us. They finally came back and said, we reserve the right to not answer that question, more or less, in typical IRS speak. So what we did with our Montreal program is to make it highly redundant uh, in, in its segregation. Um, uh, Brinks makes crime scene bags, and when you open them, they turn blue. They're clear when they're shut. You try to open them, they're blue, and they actually use them for evidence. Um, they invented this. And so we put, if it's not silver, we put gold or platinum in the bags, that's sealed with a with a, a number on the bag, a uh, Brinks five-digit number that is we record and Brinks records. Then it's put into a box with two crimp tags, each with a five-digit number that we record, Brinks records, and the auditor records. Then it's put into a box on the wall and locked with a number that we record that Brinks records, the auditor records. We do the audits twice per year. Brinks does weekly internal audits. So anything's ever open, they're doing weekly internal audits. But along the way, a couple years ago, all of a sudden, because of the redundancy between FACTA and FBAR, I believe FBAR goes to the U.S. Treasury, FACTA to the IRS, because of the redundancy, the IRS put out that form, Basic Questions and Answers, Form 8938. And what they said was the following, in order for precious metals to not be reportable, by the way, I, I believe that our Montreal program is not reportable. We have gone to great lengths to make sure it is segregated 100%. But anyways, they said, in order for it to not be reportable, it has to be directly held in a non-financial institution. Example, safe deposit box. Now, they never said only example or only safe deposit box. They call it an example. So we immediately built upon our great uh, relationship with Brinks and contacted them and said we'd like to build this program, which we did. It's in Toronto and in Vancouver. It is the only fully insured safe deposit box program in North America. Uh, they're brand new state-of-the-art safe deposit boxes with one key and one key only. Uh, most people's experience with safe deposit boxes is a two key system where you hold a key and the bank holds a key. You put them in together and then the box opens. This is different. There's one key and one spare. The client owns them both. The first question we get asked is, well, what if I can't get up there? It's okay. We send you a Federal Express air bill. You drop one of your keys in. You give us instructions. It's sent up to the facility. We're under camera and dual custody, meaning two people. The box is open. Either product is added to or taken out of. It is fully insured. It is not reportable. And it is 100% in your control. And so that is what the IRS deemed an example of directly held. Now, in my opinion, an account in Montreal or Vancouver that is not in the box is directly held because of our redundancy in segregation and auditing and making sure that everything stays where it's supposed to. And that's why we bring in the third party auditors. But for people who want to be 100 percent positive, follow the law to the letter then a safe deposit box program in Canada, in, in Vancouver or Toronto, is 100% non-reportable, fully insured. Uh, it's a wonderful program. We have loan programs at 75% loan to value, uh, whereby we can unlock the uh, equity in people's precious metals, uh, whereby this is a brand new program that we just started a couple months ago, whereby someone needs some money for a certain period of time, doesn't want to sell their gold, this is a way to do that. We will 
uh, take their gold in, put it in a storage account and pay them 75% loan to value or up to that, whatever they'd like. Um, and, and when it's paid back, ship them back their gold. Lovely program. We, we like that an awful lot as well. We are involved in the Tradewinds Vault Chain product, which is a, a Sprott backing digital gold platform uh, based upon a distributed ledger private uh, permission-based blockchain system with all the gold held at the Royal Canadian Mint and the Royal Canadian Mint uh, store, the, actually the, the Canadian government standing behind the veracity of the, of the uh, distributed ledger. Uh, we're proud of that. We were actually the very first company uh, to add gold to that ledger, we did what's called the Genesis trade. Now, I'm not a, a um, crypto guy, so I don't, a lot of your listeners might understand that better than me, but I'm told that means the first trade on the blockchain. So we have, uh, we have done that. So we have things that we can help clients with that go beyond just um, helping them acquire precious metals. Uh, we can help store, we can unlock some, some uh, equity through loans and, uh, uh, programs that you can't find just about anywhere else. So we're, we're proud of those as well. Another thing I've heard you describe that you can help people with is if they want to take advantage of the extreme that we're at in the gold to silver ratio. Uh, I heard an interview with uh, Bob Moriarty where he talked about keep it simple, folks. Buy what's cheap, sell what's expensive, and you can actually increase the size of your precious metals holdings without putting in any new cash by doing that over time. And right now, uh, we've certainly been at a high uh, gold to silver ratio compared to most historical times. Uh, can you talk to people about how they might take it, how you could help them take advantage of that? Well, I'm so glad you asked that. That is a completely astute question. And um, when I look back at some of the things that have helped build my success over the years, I would say that um, identifying and exploiting price anomalies is amongst the, my, my uh, greatest achievements. I have excelled, in my opinion, in noticing and exploiting price anomalies. And I could bring you back and talk about several of them, which I will if you'd like, but the gold and silver ratio is 100% amongst the greatest opportunities I've seen in in 30 years. The um, uh, gold to silver ratio um, goes back thousands of years where the majority of that time, a 16 to one ratio was in place. Um, what they call the God's ratio is um, uh, what comes out of the ground at typically the, um, I think the number is 15.5 to one. In other words, silver is 15.5 times more abundant in the earth's crust than is gold. Um, and so when you look at, at what's coming out of the ground right now, uh, Keith Newmeyer uh, has told me that what they see coming out of the ground right now is closer to nine to one. And so when we see a ratio that for the last 150 years has averaged, let's say 45 to one, uh, trading at 90 to one right now, um, you have a what I consider four feet of snow in the Florida Keys in August moment. It just doesn't happen. It is completely and totally an anomaly. Uh, it doesn't make sense. The last time we saw a ratio of 80 to one or better was 2010. By 2011, we had $2,000 gold and $50 silver. That's 40 to one. So when you identify and exploit price anomalies, there also has to be an exit. And so when, when I look at this, I don't look at it as switching to silver. I look at it as moving to silver temporarily until the ratio normalizes. And then as you said, exiting back into gold, doubling what you started with and never paying a penny. That is the beautiful thing of it, continuing to play the ratio. Now I wanna you know, one of the things I don't like about pundits, and I don't consider myself to be one, I'm a normal guy who just works hard, but pundits often tout their successes and don't acknowledge when they were wrong. For the last year and a half, I've been saying to people, trade your palladium for platinum. And lo and behold, I was wrong. But I'll tell you this, I look at palladium in two ways. One, as a precursor of what we'll see in silver. We, got, we two, had a glitch there again. If you could say, I look at things two ways. Can you start that again? Sure. So I look at, at this in two ways. Um, number one, I look at 
silver as a precursor to the palladium market right now. I think it will mirror its movement in terms of the manipulation by the central banks and the commercial banks. But more importantly, it is what appears to me a free market. In a world of markets that continue to be toyed with and manipulated, as Chris Powell from the Gold Antitrust Action Committee is, is, is often very fond of saying, there are no free markets anymore, just manipulations. Um, and as um, I, I don't want to digress too much, but I, since I mentioned Chris Paul, I would like to put a plug in for the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. Anyone who owns precious metals owes them a debt of gratitude. They have tirelessly worked to liberate the precious metals markets and to to expose uh, uh, or let's say try to bring a free market to the precious metals industry. And I and I love them for that. And anytime I get a chance, just to give them kudos, I like to do that. Yeah, we've interviewed Bill Murphy on our channel many times, and uh, always always get an uh, eye-opening uh, expose of the of the hijinks that happen behind the scenes. And it sounds like you know we we've seen a few things exposed through the DOJ and the and the spoofing yeah. and so on that was going on at uh, J.P. Morgan. But it sounds like there's a lot more than that, much bigger picture than that well, than a small fish. There really is, and so palladium seems to be traded freely, as close to a free market as you can get. The the traders really have stopped shorting it and let it go. I think you'll see that with silver someday, to be honest with you. I think a supply-demand imbalance will take effect. I would still tell someone, um, trade your palladium for platinum. You know, the, the traders even are skeptical of, of palladium with a $200 bid-ask spread. That that's, that's not really normal. But when we look back throughout history, most of my career, which is 30 years long, Palladium has been about a third the price of platinum. Hmm. So, you know, when you look at ratios, I think it's very important to understand that the law of averages is there for a reason. And mathematical um, uh, ratios are, are there for us to learn from. And when something, the further away something gets, in this case, the gold-silver ratio at 90 to 1, the further away we get from historical averages, call it 45 to 1, the greater the magneticism that pulls us back to the mean or to the center. Remember the quote from uh, the, or the Oracle of Omaha, uh, Warren yeah. Buffett saying that volatility creates mispricing and mispr mispricing creates opportunity. So That's exactly it. The, there has been a great deal of volatility and there's tremendous opportunities that are that based on price distortions and anomalies in, in price and in historical price. So, you know, it's frustrating for those of us who have held metal for a while who will realize that uh, logic and outcome have had somewhat of an inverse correlation over the years. But <laughs> ultimately, you can only run so far from mathematics before it catches you. So I would simply say this. In terms of a calculated bet, I think that anyone would be wise to consider trading some of their gold for silver at this ratio temporarily until we see that ratio snap back into its mean or its average. And when that happens, you swap back into gold, doubling what you started with without ever spending a penny. And I'm really glad you brought that up. But there's anomalies everywhere right now. Palladium to gold, uh, and excuse me, palladium to platinum and to gold, uh, um, gold to silver. The price of numismatics um, are cheaper than gold eagles uh, in, in uncirculated 62 grade. I've never seen that. In 2008, they were trading at $600 premiums to $1,000 gold price, with gold eagles trading at a $50 premium to $1,000 gold price. So the bottom line is, is that there's a lot of inconsistencies, distortions, and anomalies right now where people can really take advantage of perhaps building their portfolio, strengthening it, repositioning it, and the only thing that they're going to spend is a little bit on postage. The rest of it would be, um, I think, mathematically really logical in, in repositioning to these undervalued items from the super overvalued items with the expectation of going back once things normalize. And, you know, the law of averages says that will happen when that's anybody's guess. But I will say this. When you see the most sophisticated traders on the planet, J.P. Morgan, which are also the largest short position on the COMEX market, oh, and by the way, are being charged with RICO charges, as the Justice Department puts, uh, running a criminal enterprise in six of their, or their precious metals desk, a criminal enterprise, six of their traders are, are uh, under indictment for RICO charges, which is racketeering, which means they can actually go after the bank itself 
And the latest communication I've read says that's indeed perhaps what the Justice Department is targeting, actually the bank itself. So, you know, there is some enlightenment going on, but yet you know, we're not there yet. And I think there's real opportunities because that bank has amassed, according to Ted Butler, another guy who's brilliant and does a lot of great work, amassed over 950 million ounces of silver. That's 9.5 times more than the Hunt brothers tried to buy in 1980. It's the largest physical position of silver the world's ever seen at one time. So you have the biggest short position, maybe the most sophisticated traders on the planet, maybe the most nefarious also, But in the know, well-funded and well-informed, and they are amassing nine and a half times what the Hunt brothers tried to buy for a reason. And it's important to note that they didn't need to accumulate the physical either when we talk about where silver could possibly be going, because as Ted Butler will tell you, it's all public information. They have done tens of thousands of trades since 2008. And, And since 2008, when they did those 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 trades, whatever it is, not one of them, not one has ever been a loser. Not one. It's a mathematic impossibility. Pick your favorite baseball player who gets 500 at-bats during a regular season. It's like him batting 1,000 for the year, never striking out, never grounding out, never flying out. It's impossible, yet they have found a way to do it. And so when you have a track record of being able to make unlimited money without ever losing a penny on paper, why go to the trouble of accumulating so much silver if not for a reason? And so when people talk about manipulation, I think it's important to say, why? Why are they manipulating it? And I think the real reason is to corner the physical market in silver. They have over 25 million ounces of gold. And I think that, you know, if you dig deeper, you'll find that a lot of these institutions are doing it with base metals, with uh, fossil fuels, uh, oil and and gasoline. And price is what controls the masses and creates the reality. So by holding down the paper price with the tremendous amount of leverage, they have the ability to create a perception of reality that has allowed them to accumulate all this silver. But while they've done so, it's created these inequities. These inequities at at 90 to one, that's highly, highly, highly unusual, completely unusual. And uh, it's a strong opportunity and one that I stand behind. Um, While there are no guarantees, I would say from a betting perspective, uh, it's as good of a a hedged bet as you'll ever find, uh, as good of an opportunity as you'll ever find to increase your gold holdings without opening your wallet, no question. We, there's a related question here from a viewer. Max Headroom says, the age-old expression that one ounce of gold would buy a nice suit, I've heard it said all the way back from the Roman era, a nice toga, whatever. Is that statement saying on average, or are there times, and I think this is what we're talking about when you're far from the mean, times when it could have bought 10 nice suits because of distrust in fiat currency and a rush to precious metals? Well, you know, I, I, I think what that statement is, we can look at it a little bit more clearly. Um, Back then, go back 100 years ago in the United States, when I said numismatic gold, talking about a $20 gold piece. So, you know, let's say someone's grandfather or great-grandfather left them two boxes. Uh, one box was filled with uh, $10,000 in Federal Reserve notes, uh, and the other one was filled with $500 $20 gold pieces. Uh, and that's what they were. They were interchangeable back then. You'll find, you'll see the, the Federal Reserve gold notes that were minted uh, or made until like 1936, somewhere in that neighborhood, I think, even though gold had already been confiscated in 33. But the note, instead of saying, in God we trust, it said, payable to the bearer on demand in gold coins. That's right. And so um, they were the same thing. So opening up those boxes now, the $10,000, well, yeah, that's that's great. Um, But the uh, 500 ounces of gold, has retained its value in twenty-dollar gold pieces. It's worth you know seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. So, when we talk about an ounce of gold retaining its value, I'll even give you one better. Now I'm gonna. This is from memory, so you got to give me a little slack. But um, I, I've used this in a lot of public speaking, and I really think it drives home the point. Okay, so the numbers that I used, and I'm doing this from memory, are from the Census Bureau. 
1960, the average price of a home was 16975 Call it $17,000. And gold was $39. So I'm going to do the math here real quick. Uh, 17000 divided by 39 is 435 So great-grandfather leaves us 435 ounces of gold. And in 1960, a uh, couple says, should we um, – sell the gold to buy the house and have no debt? Or should we keep that gold that grandfather left us and take out a mortgage for $17,000? Now remember in 1960, $17,000 was an awful lot of money. It was real money back then. Yes, it was. And um, so with that being said, um, the decision was made to stick the gold under our mattress and not touch it. So here we are uh, 60 years later, that gold has earned nothing but dust, no interest, and it's been under our mattress. The average price of a home now in the United States is, um, I think it was about $300,000, uh, or the give or take, according to the Census Bureau, as of 2019. And, and what's gold today? 1600 plus. So 200 ounces will buy you that same house. You could get over two homes fully furnished for the same gold that's earned no interest for 60 years. The point of it is, is that I think of gold as kind of hanging over the ledge of the bathtub as the barometer. The water inside the bathtub is the currency that we value it on. And as the, as, as the currency starts to lose value, the gold stays the same. And it retains purchasing power as the currency from underneath us is inflated away. So whether you talk the, the, the one ounce of gold being worth a, a finely tailored men's suit but what does 1650 buy you today? Buy you a suit, a tie, the whole nine yards. But the $20 gold piece, that was the ounce of gold back then. What does that buy you? It doesn't even buy you the red tie you're weighing right now. So, you know, the point of it is, is that gold is a preservation of wealth tool when currency that we have is not. And, you know, when you have a, a Federal Reserve who says our stated mission is to foster 2% inflation, well, that's hogwash. It shouldn't be that, and it's a lot more than that. How about mm -hmm. no inflation or right. minimal inflation? So, you know, the bottom line is it's an insidious thing, inflation, but it happens right out from under us, and and the value of our currency is precipitously declining, and gold really, even though it's valued in our currency in terms of what it buys you in gold uh, goods and services, ought to stay the same. But using the 1960 example to where we are now with the home, not only did it, as you mentioned, are there times when it buys more? Yeah, it almost buys you three houses or for sure two fully furnished uh, instead of just that one. So I, I think it's the ultimate tool of preservation that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. You don't have to worry about counterparty risk with gold in your basement. Uh, you might have to with U.S. Treasuries the way things are going or securities in, uh, in an overvalued stock market. Uh, Andy, we're running low on time, but I wanted to uh, give you one more viewer's question. And this one gets back to something you mentioned. Having been in the precious metals business as long as you have, you've been through at least one major cycle in the uh, in the last run-up in 2011 period when uh, silver, silver and gold took off and uh, everybody thought we were going to go to the moon. In those times when there's a run-up um, and there's a lot of loss of confidence in the, the rest of the financial system. There's a question from here from a viewer called Nothing to No One in particular. In the event of a financial collapse or reset, who will be buying silver? The banks? So when you saw the most uh, concern in the, in the financial and, and people's economic lives in the past, um, who was it that was buying uh, precious metals at those peak times, uh, if you have any way of gauging that? Well, I, 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 I like that question, too. No, um, it's not the banks, but I'm glad you mentioned that. And I'll answer that. And I know we're running low on time, but I want to bring up what I think is the most important thing of my career. And I've been saying this lately. In fact, I started talking about this in July. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll add a little to it. In 2011, we were doing 200 orders a day. Um, and it was lots of people, small orders, um, nothing big. As the price ran up, there wasn't um, an overwhelming sense of fear. Um, there was more centered around greed. But it was everyone was buying gold and silver, not the banks. In fact, the banks have been selling it. And um, I could never 
figure out why they were selling it. Um, and I'll tell you when I look at I'm going to come back to that in one second. just want to tempt you for a minute. But when I look at last year, we had a wonderful year, one of our biggest years ever. Um, but we did one-tenth the order volume, maybe 20 orders a day instead of 200. So now it's more of the um, accredited investor, bigger orders. The The person on the street in the United States is, is woefully um, unaware of what's going on. And maybe that's because the stock market seems to defy gravity. But when I go back over all my career and look at previous peaks, I'll tell you why it never took off, and I'll tell you why the banks weren't buying it. Um, and it was just the average person who kept getting their their hopes and dreams shattered. Um, because prior to April 1st of last year, gold was considered a tier three asset. And a tier three asset meant that only 50% of the value was calculated on the balance sheet. So there were four reasons why central bankers would have want nothing to do with gold. One, it earned no interest. Two, it cost money to store. Three, it was unpredictable. Four, the tier three status meant that a 50% haircut goes on the balance sheet, denigrating the balance sheet, making it harder to sell bonds or write bonds and to do international business. So you get these new kids in that replace the gray hair and say, what the heck do we want this gold for? It's it's collecting nothing but dust. It costs money to store. And we can't write as many bonds as we'd like to sell the public, which generate income for the country. Let's sell it. So, so much so that in the 90s, the, all the central banks signed on to something called the Washington Agreement, which would limit what they could all sell to 500 metric tons. So to not completely turn the gold market upside down. In 2017, well, every year, the banks, central banks meet in Basel, Switzerland, uh, where the Bank of International Settlements is located, the central bank or central bank. They make all the rules as it pertains to banks. I think they told the central banks time to start loading up on gold because in 2018, they bought more gold than at any time in the previous 60 years. They went from net sellers in 2017 and previous to massive accumulators. In 2019, those numbers were up almost 90%. And so far this year, every small central bank from Central America to, to Eastern Europe are gobbling up gold because it has been reclassified through the Basel III agreement as of April 1st of last year. Now, they gave them a heads up. They take care of themselves first. So they started buying it a year and a half earlier. But as of April 1st, it's the only other tier one asset on the planet next to US dollars and treasuries. Why? Why would they do that? Why now would they make another tier one asset, um, if not for a reason? Give them an escape valve? I don't know. But the bottom line is, is that all of the years past, we've been fighting the most sophisticated, in the know, well-funded and well-informed investors on the planet who have been doing all they can to mitigate their exposure to gold and buy U.S. treasuries and dollars to enhance their balance sheet and make them be able to sell more bonds. Now, that's flip-flopped. And now countries like Russia are selling all of their treasuries and accumulating tremendous amounts of gold, as is China, as are most of the world's central banks. They now have an out. But think about it for a moment. It is the only other tier one asset on the planet. So for the first time in my career, you have the central banks on our side instead of fighting against us. So this time when it goes to the moon, I don't know who will be buying it, but I can tell you this, the central banks are buying it right now and they are de-dollarizing. And if I could give any advice to people, regardless of the fact that I make my living selling precious metals with 100% objectivity, you do what the, the most influential people in the world are doing, the people that make the rules, they're slowly exiting dollar stage left and accumulating gold in massive quantities. And it's the only other asset on the planet that is tier one, and that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. It's a no-brainer right now. And when we talk about silver, real quick, silver was not reclassified as a tier one asset. Might be why it's lagging a little bit, but throughout all, there's a 90% correlate between the two. So when you see JP Morgan amassing such a big position, it makes me feel a little bit better that ultimately, both of these metals are gonna run. When you see these big institutions doing what they're doing, I think it foretells where we're going to ultimately end up and who's going to buy it? Everyone, as they rush to exit the dollar. So um, 
I think that's a good problem to have to figure out who's going to buy it from you. But at least you'll have options when everyone else who's stuck in dollars, if the dollar runs into trouble, they'll have none. They'll have no options whatsoever. People who hold precious metals will be like the old hunter back in the turn of the century who hunted porcupine with a wash tub. Throw it over the wash tub and sit on the wash tub for a minute and think about what your next move is. And so I'd rather be on the wash tub than chasing the porcupine or worse yet, being chased by it. Yeah, you reminded me of a quote that Rick Rule has said several times, and that is that in the bull market, gold moves first and silver moves farther. And I think you also answered along the way a question that I was going to ask you by Victory CSA is, do you share my opinion that the BIS making gold a tier one asset is the most important development in gold and silver rising in price now and returning to fair market value? Uh, any last thoughts on the, what you see ahead for 2020 uh, before we let you go? Um. I think all bets are off with this coronavirus, and I'm not saying that. I mean, I, I'm I'm a little frightened by it, and I think you know when you talk about whether or not it affects us all from a health standpoint, and I'm hopeful it doesn't. I think it will drastically affect this just-in-time supply chain mm. uh, economy that we're in, and I think it's baked into the cake. Uh, when a, when a company like Jaguar Land Rover says if the, if the factory doesn't open in the next week or two, they're out, they will stop producing cars, that's real. I think that um, all bets are off. One last thing, and I'll let you go as well. Um, there's a group called Ibbotson, I-B-B-O-T-S-O-N. They, they are a research group out of Chicago. They were bought by Morningstar. Most people know who Morningstar is. They're the company that researches mutual funds and stocks and rates them and what have you. Uh, before they were bought by Morningstar a few years ago, they were tasked with finding alternatives to the United States stock market. And they came back and they said, because interest rates are so low, they used to be that stocks were risk on and bonds were risk off. We work, we put our money in stocks, and as we get closer to retirement, we take that risk off the table and put them into bonds. In the 90s, you could earn 9% on treasuries. You put $2 million into into 9% treasuries, you don't ever have to touch your principal for the rest of your life. You're on easy street. Now, that 2 million brings in 40,000 if you're lucky, mm -hmm. instead of 180,000. And so what they came back and said was, the only inversely correlated asset to the United States stock market anymore are precious metals, the only one. And so when we talk about what happens if the stock market takes it on a chin, what happens if there's a run on the dollar, um, the only place to be are precious metals. So I don't want to uh, be a, a purveyor of doom and gloom and say that this is the coronavirus is the pin that pricks the bubble. But if we do see a stock market collapse, um, you're going to want to have precious metals as according to Morningstar and Ibbotson, there are no other uh, inversely correlated assets to the U.S. stock market. And I would add to the U.S. dollar. And so now that it is a tier one asset, and, and to your other listener, I view it as the most watershed, game-changing, important event of my career, 100%. And I think people should take note of that, um, whether, uh, whether they, they uh, buy gold or silver, it doesn't matter. I think just start adding uh, or minimizing, mitigating our exposure entirely to the U.S. dollar, and, and that's important. So uh, if someone told me gold would be at 2000 by the end of the year and silver would be at 22 or better, I'd believe it. That's still that crazy ratio. So I'd like to see silver do better than that. But I think that the Basel III tier one deal could propel gold ahead for a while. And when silver finally catches up, as Rick says, it will do better. It will slingshot uh, and, and ought to perform on a percentage basis much, much better. But I'm very cautiously optimistic for, for gold and silver. I just don't like what comes with it. Mm. Uh, with what could happen to us all and to the economy. And so um, I, I look at, at gold and silver not as an investment. I look at it as wealth. And at a time of great uncertainty, I'd rather have wealth that has a 6,000-year track record of maintaining its value rather than uh, paper that is um, you know, arguably close to the end of its run based upon many factors. I just wanted to mention to everybody that uh – 
Andy and I are both going to be attending the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium in Vancouver. You, we mentioned it on our interview with Rick Rule just recently. Mentioning it again now because I'll, you'll be able to find me and meet me in person. Uh, Dunning and Kaiser will be glad to shake your hand at the uh, Miles Franklin booth, and you can meet Andy Sheckman there as well. So, Andy, it'll be great to, to meet you in person and to be able to see so many people who come out there to find out more about what's really going on in talking about sound money and and the reality of things you can trust uh, when times get rocky, uh, it'll be great to to join forces and uh, to see you at that event. Can't tell you how excited I am to join forces with such a quality human being. And uh, for for your listeners out there, of all of the shows to attend, there is none better than the Sprout Show. It is the finest show in the industry. The um, the the people who attend, the speakers. It's just top notch all the way. So uh, absolutely, would love to uh, see any of uh, of the people out there there as well, and and of course uh, get to spend a, a week with you. So thanks again, and uh, look forward to uh, being back with you next time. Great. I should have mentioned to everybody, if you look in the description of this video, you'll see a link to where you can find out more information about the Sprott Symposium and a discount code you can use if you decide to attend. So, Oh, and Rick Rule said yesterday on our show that if anybody attends the show and they have a sincere interest in, in the uh, natural resources and they decide after the show that they didn't get more value out of it than what they paid to attend, that uh, he'll, he'll uh, if they write a description to that to him in an in a email, He'll uh, re- return their money for the for the show because he's so convinced that people are going to get value out of it, as you uh, have found out as well. So it's really the only show that's a must must attend for me. So absolutely. Well, Andy, we've been uh, gl- grateful for your first visit here. We've been speaking with Andy Schechtman. He's the president of MilesFranklin.com, and uh, that's where they can find out more. If people want to find out more, is there any other research available there that they should look into? Yeah, that's a good place. I also. Um, make myself available. I, uh, as I told you, um, we have pulled down our online store. There's too much fraud in the industry. There's too much identity theft. I would rather be uh, more analog in this digital world as it pertains to precious metals. I think it's important. So I, like Rick Rule, answer everybody's email. If someone emails me personally at Andy at Miles Franklin, I will answer their, um, their message personally. And um, again, we do things the old fashioned way. When it comes time to purchasing, give us a call, chat with us, call me personally, email me. And uh, we believe in education and relationship. And heck, if they just want to place an order, we can do that too. But um, Andy at Miles Franklin, we do publish a daily newsletter as well. And um, uh, I welcome anyone to, to drop a note and say hello and ask a question. I'm happy to answer. Excellent. Thank you, Andy, for joining us here this first time on Liberty and Finance. I hope to be back again real soon. Thank you. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions.